boomerangs, bombs, dungeons, magic swords, puzzles, and green tunics. Welcome to The Legend of Zelda. While Nintendo has helped pioneer dozens of gaming conventions that still influence the industry today, one of their trademark tactics is to cross their properties across multiple platforms and peripherals. Sometimes this can lead to some superfluous purchases, but it can also introduce revolutionary ways to make an old formula feel like a completely new experience. After Link made his daring jump into the third dimension with two successful games for the Nintendo 64, Nintendo joined forces with Capcom to continue the fantasy franchise. Just months before they shipped their next home console, the GameCube, Nintendo added a true green to Link's tunic on the newly RGB upgraded Game Boy Color. Under the supervision of Miyamoto, Oracle of Ages and Oracle of Seasons were released on the same day in May of 2001. These dual handheld titles were originally going to be a part of the Triforce Trilogy, where the two original NES games were to be revamped and included with one completely new game to finish off the acutely symmetrical package. This concept gradually evolved into an all-new trilogy-based project, where each game would represent a third of the Triforce. Unfortunately, it became extremely troublesome to link all three titles, using a brand new password system. Thus, this adventure set was pared down to only two games. Each would be able to stand on its own, but they could also be joined together by using passwords to transfer your progress. From a gameplay perspective, the two games also split the infamous Zelda formula right down the center. Oracle of Ages was primarily puzzle-based for the brain-teasing, labyrinth-exploring crowd, while Oracle of Seasons was more action-oriented for those who favored adventuring with a sword and bow. These quests were unique, but incomplete without the other if you wanted a true Zelda experience. And of course, the true ending to both games. Both the Oracle adventures started the same. On one of Link's frequent visits to the dimension-shifting, glistening gold relic in the Temple of the Triforce, presumably to make sure no one had stolen it again, he was voluntarily pulled into a portal that spit him out in either the world of Labrena or Holodrum. There, he met the Oracles, the singer Nehru or the dancer Den. Just as they introduced themselves to their unexpected guest, the General of Darkness, Onox, or the Sorceress of Shadows, Varon, kidnapped one of these newfound friends and threw their respective worlds off balance. Labrena's flow of time was disrupted, and Link would have to find the eight essences of time to set it right again. To do this, he could travel a hundred years into the past, and then back to the present, changing events and rewriting history as he made each trip back and forth. Haldurum's passage of seasons was adversely affected, and Link was required to wave a magic wand to alter the world between them, allowing him to access different areas. Haldurum's map was bigger than Labrena, but the Ages world was doubled up due to the alternate time periods. Fans could either choose the playstyle they preferred from two technically similar but thematically different journeys to Hyrule and beyond, or combine them for one of the most elaborate quests Link's ever quested. While they may be the two least played games in the franchise, they shared all the elements from their predecessors that make the series continuously impressive. One year later, Nintendo ported A Link to the Past to the Game Boy Advance with a few cosmetic changes. Along with the SNES Classic, the cartridge also featured, for the first time ever, a multiplayer Zelda game, entitled Four Swords. While the game might have been thought of as just a bonus feature, it was a solid Zelda game. However, finding three friends with GBA to GBA adapters and copies of the game was another story. Luckily, in 2004, Nintendo released the Four Swords Adventures for the GameCube. The new version allowed one lone gamer to control all four little links by snapping them into one of four battle formations. The game was much more linear than any Zelda title before it, with no connecting overworld. It was clearly built as a party game or cooperative quest. Similar to how the Oracle Twins did a cartridge crossover, Four Swords was designed to transfer data, this time between consoles, via a GameCube to GBA cable. A single player could complete the adventure with just a GameCube controller, but once another player jumped in, everyone needed their own Game Boy Advance to come along. Your perspective would shift from the TV to the handheld in dungeons, caves, houses, and other interiors. Four Swords also marked the return of Dark Link, a doppelganger the good Link faced in Zelda 2 and Ocarina. 
had adorable cartoon animation, several head-scratching zone-swapping puzzles, and a top-down perspective with polished lighting, characters, backgrounds, and special effects. Technically, it was the closest thing to a true Link to the Past sequel fans had seen since 1992. While these games might not have been as commercially successful as their gold-plated predecessors, they showcased Nintendo's willingness to try new things and experiment with their technology. Stay tuned as we follow Link's journey back to consoles with a brand new, unexpected look in The Wind Waker and the penultimate example of Link's handheld prowess, the Minish Cap.